Hello this beautiful Wednesday evening. I hope everybody's had a very blessed day and a little bit nippy today, but praise God, we got through it. And if you're working, well, we just pray that your work will go good and everything looks up. You know, when you get your, get your mind focused on the Lord Jesus, you can't help but to win. And tonight, uh, I want to talk about our enthusiasm. Now, how many of y'all, excuse me, how many of y'all have plenty of enthusiasm? And enthusiasm is an ecstasy of the mind, as if from divine or spiritual influence and elevation of fancy. And enthusiasm, it uh, intrigues the world. And it's almost like a phenomenon when you see people all excited and you want to know why are you so excited? Why are you uh, acting like that and everything? Uh, an enthusiastic person is a happy person. And uh, there's something about a victorious Christian that we ought to be the happiest people on planet Earth. And I've told her. Uh, church members many of the time that uh, you know that uh, very same phrase that as a Christian uh, we should be uh, the happiest people because uh, we know where we're going we know that we win we know that the devil don't have nothing on us he's nothing but a liar and uh, even and see, people are drawn uh, to a consistent, excited believer. Now, if you up one day and you down the next day and you sort of roller coaster riding, one day you live for the Lord, next day you not, uh, you're not going to get many people to follow you like that. you got to be as consistent as you can. And with all the negatives in the world, Today, how can a person be excited in a down world? Now, uh, we, you know, this COVID thing that has been going on that goes from one variant to another variant and, and to another, and it just keeps mutating, and, and we're seeing good people pass away, and uh, some from it, some from different reasons, and, and yet it's possible regardless of what's going on in the world, regardless of, excuse me, I'm about to sneak. <coughs> regardless of your financial status or even your past failures, you can still be enthusiastic. You can still be excited about life. In Ephesians, you got your Bible, turn to Ephesians chapter 2. I'll give you a moment to get there. And uh, we're going to look at some scripture. And uh, uh, you can step in to a victory zone uh, and stay excited about life. You know, uh, what is old saying? Mind over matter, if you don't uh, have no mind, it doesn't matter. But we do have a mind, and we're to have the mind of Christ. And so uh, what we do with our mind, that's the thing of, uh, if you're with me there in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6, and it says, And hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now, just for a moment, do you see yourself sitting up in the presence of Jesus? Now, if you read the Gospels of John, of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, especially John chapter 14, 15, 16, you'll find that 
we have, if we've been born again, we have Jesus Christ living in us, the Holy Spirit, God the Father. We have the, the triune living inside of us. And Jesus said, if you abide in me, my word abide in you, and we'll make our abode. Talking about the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit in us. Now, if we can get a picture of that mentally and see ourselves sitting seated in heavenly places, then what on this earth can cause us to lose the excitement and the joy of being in the presence of God? God intended for us to be up. Jesus said in St. John chapter 10, verse 10, the thief come to steal, kill, and destroy. He's been doing it for thousands of years. He, he knows every trick in the book. But Jesus said, but I come that you might have life and might have it more abundantly. Well, abundant life isn't one of gloom, uh, despair and agony is me, deep dark depression, excessive misery. If it weren't for bad luck, I'd have no luck at all. That's not abundant life. Abundant life is where we're not just scratching to get by, but we are exceeding and excelling in whatever we do. He provided a plan to get us there spiritually to get us there mentally, emotionally, and physically. Now, there's four things that uh, you must do to increase your enthusiasm. Now, number one, you've got to rebuild your concept of God. What is your ideal of God? Is he a dictator? Or is he a loving father? I mean, you look at, you read in uh, Luke chapter 15 about the prodigal son. The son said he went and wasted his living, everything he had in his inheritance and everything, and was eating with the pigs. And he said, you know, my servant, or my father's servants live better than I'm living. And I'll go back and just see. But the father was waiting and watching for him. And when he came, before the son could even ask for forgiveness, the father done forgave him. That's the love of God for us. That's, that's God's grace beyond our understanding. And that's why we all... If we can just tap into the concept of how much God loves us, then one is we wouldn't want to be doing the wrong thing. But two is we're going to be so excited about God, we can't help but to be happy all the time. And not saying that we don't have our trials and sometimes we uh, fail to keep a smile on the face, you know, uh, we used to, uh, some of us uh, years ago at church, uh, would talk about having permagrim. As a Christian, we ought to have permagrim, but how many knows that sometimes we lose that grin on our face. We let things get under our skin when we shouldn't. But we've got to learn the love of God. You look at uh, and study the life of Jesus. And you find that he talked to immoral people. He talked to women, to children, to corrupt government officials. People mattered to Jesus. You matter to God. And without God, you don't even know how to love people. And that's, and I'll vouch for that 100% because till I accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, back in uh, 1990, 
I really didn't know what love was. Since then, I've learned how to love my spouse unconditionally, regardless of how her health or anything else. Love our children. Doesn't mean we condone anything or everything that they do, but we love them and love people. You know, uh, sinners are going to sin, and sometimes Christians will do things that they shouldn't do. Bottom line is, when we get our our perspective of God going in the right direction. It's going to cause you to be enthusiastic about the Lord. And uh, so that's something that we have to work on. The second thing about keeping your enthusiasm is recognize the limitations of Satan. He's a liar. He's a deceiver. He's a manipulator. He is a loser. And also the first employee of heaven to get kicked out of heaven, he got fired and thrown out. And he can never get back in heaven, never get back in right standing with God. So why in the world do we want to listen to somebody that talks that garbage all the time? He is under the dominion of the believers. He's under our feet. <laughs> One of our, our uh, neighbors, she's went to be of the Lord, but many years ago, I used to, I'd see her uh, like down in Old Town Market or, or uh, Walmart or somewhere like that. And uh, I just thought the world of her, she's just a super sweet lady. And uh, she'd... <laughs> She'd often say, boy, the devil's been on my back. And, and I wanted to say, well, why in the world are you laying down with the devil? Because he is under our feet, or he's under the feet of Jesus. We're his body. So the only way we can get down to the devil's level is to lay down and roll with him. Matter of fact, back up to, uh, if you still in Ephesians, back up chapter 1. And let's look right here in verse 21 and 22. Uh, well, let's get verse 20. Which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places. Far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet, all things under his feet, gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body the fullness of him that filleth all in all. We are part of his body. His feet's over the principalities. He, his feet is just uh, crushing that serpent's head, the old devil's head. And we just have to learn to, to recognize that the devil can't get up to our level, so let's not get down to his level. Uh, matter of fact, if you read in Romans uh, chapter 8, verse 37, it says, Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors. And the Greek word for more than conquerors is hooper, H-U-P-E-R, Nikeo. And it means super victorious. We're not just barely winning. We are kicking the doors wide open and I mean, we ought to be celebrating that we have such victory over the enemy. But we've got to get it from here in our spirit man to our head knowledge. Because, you know, it's like what we, like last night where I was teaching about the words we speak. You know, 
Uh, if you're an enthusiastic person, you're going to be speaking positive things. You're going to have a positive attitude. You're going to have the right outlook. And when you start having the right outlook, you're going to start having the right outcome. And uh, so, you know, remember, you're a winner. Even when you feel at your lowest, you're still above the devil. The third thing about keeping your enthusiasm is understand the needs of others. Now, this is something that I think a lot of times uh, churches miss it. Uh, sometimes they become like the Pharisees and Sadducees. But there's two types of people who receives the attention of Jesus Christ. Two types. The ones that receive his ministry and his work. Zacchaeus, good example. You can read Luke chapter 19. Zacchaeus was a tax collector. They were known to be corrupt. And yet, he climbed up a tree to be able to look down and see Jesus. See who, who this man was that everybody was uh, over-enthusiastic about. And when Jesus looked up and seen old little old Zacchaeus, he says, Zacchaeus, come on down. I'm coming to your house tonight for supper. And Zacchaeus made haste, went and prepared for Jesus. I don't know if anybody else invited Jesus. They was all wanting something from Jesus, but Zacchaeus said, you come to my house, and I'll fix you, I will fix you a meal. And the other one, a good one to look at, is the Samaritan woman in St. John chapter 4. I mean, if it had been the disciples, they wouldn't have even spoke to her. Yet Jesus not only spoke to her, he spoke in such a way that it had intrigued her that she actually received the, him as the Messiah and went out into the city telling everyone about come see a man that told me all about me and didn't condemn me love me and they wouldn't believe her but they came to see jesus why because of her enthusiasm jesus recognizes people that want him and then the other type of people that jesus pays attention to is those that minister to him. Two right off the bat, Mary and Martha, the sisters of Lazarus. They both catered to Jesus. They both had him to come to their house. They both took care of him. And who didn't? The ones that should have. The Pharisees didn't. Matter of fact, when you read the Gospels, you'll find that the Pharisees revealed they had contempt for Jesus. For they didn't minister to him. And they didn't accept anything he had to say. The Pharisees, Sadducees, both of them, they just, they condemned him. They're the ones that, uh, help get him to be crucified. Cultivate discernment of people in your life. And this is something that's very, very important because if we all should be positive influences in people's life. And if you're hanging with people that's got a negative influence, then you need to rethink about that negative influence affecting you. Because sooner or later it will. Proverbs chapter 13 verse 20 says, He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, 
but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. Jesus didn't spend time with everyone. Uh, he had the 70, he had the 12, but he spent a lot of time with the three, Peter, James, and John. They were with him more than the other nine were, and the other nine were more than the other 70 that was. Don't even know who the 70 was. They don't even mention their names. Then the fourth thing is you've got to rebuild a good picture of yourself. Parents, schooling, friends, condition us. And we can either become failure conscience or we become problem oriented instead of being a possibility oriented or a positive uh, oriented. Sometimes we concentrate more on our weaknesses and lose confidence and self-respect. That's why, you know, our weakness can be our strength. Uh, Paul said, when I'm weak, Jesus is strong. So Paul let God take his weakness and make it his strength. And that's what we have to do. We have to change the way our mindset works to be able to do that. That's why sometimes what we consider a weakness is actually a God-implanted gift. You've got to have the right ideal about God. You've got to have the right ideal about the devil. You've got to have the right ideal about people. And you've got to have the right ideal about you. Because if you are down on yourself, you're not seeing yourself the way God sees you. That's why you need to get in the Word. Because if you get in the Word, you'll find that God loves you. God has a plan for you. God wants you to have an abundant life. And obedience is one of the keys of being able to do that. So... If you're lacking on enthusiasm, think over these four steps. Go back over this uh, session of teaching and look and see, am I missing this part? Am I missing this part? Am I not thinking right? You know, Romans chapter 12 tells us, verse 1, 2, to be not conformed to the world, be transformed by the renewing of our mind that we may prove that which is good and acceptable and perfect will unto God. Prove to God. God wants us to prove to him that we're changing our mindset, that we learn that he loves us, that he loves us and wants the best for us, and that when we have these little bumps in the road, let them just make us more enthusiastic about the Lord. Let it draw us closer to God. That's why where Paul said, you know, when I'm weak, he's strong. He's also said that, you know, uh, I will rather therefore gladly rejoice in my infirmities, in other words, in my weakness, because he would get it. He, would, he knew what enthusiasm was. Because he knew that when he couldn't do it, God had a plan that was going to get him through it. And God is no respecter of persons. What he did for Paul, he'll do for you and me. We just got to get the right mindset. So with that said, uh, a little bit shorter teaching tonight because I know I got a little bit long-winded last night. Want to invite everybody to come join us Sunday morning at 11, 11, 10 a.m. actually, about time we usually get started. And I know we've got uh, some, some of our members are in quarantine right now, uh, going through COVID, and we're just praying for them to, to be able to just recover quickly, overcome it, and get 
po uh, uh, good negative results so that they can get back to uh, being parked, uh, the family get back to normal routine and health restored. Uh, so, but the main thing is, do you know Jesus? Do you know that Jesus Christ loves you so much? He gave his only son, his only son to come down here and to be beaten, battered, and crucified so that me and you could receive him and have eternal life. He didn't come to condemn us. As John 3, 16, 17, people quote John 3, 16, for God so loved the world he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But verse 17 is as important, for he did not come to condemn the world. The world's done condemned already. Jesus come to set us free from being condemned. And you can do that right now, whether you've never accepted Jesus Christ or if you've backslid on God. If you'll pray this simple prayer with me and, and believe it in your heart and your mind, speak it with your mouth. God will change your life. So let's just pray. Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus Christ. I believe that Jesus went to the cross, shed his blood for my sins. And that right now, as we read, that he is seated with you on the right hand of you, Father. And he is over everything. And we are his body. And so, Father, you put your Holy Spirit in me so that I can be connected and live for you from this day on. And I thank you and I praise you for the love that you had, the grace and mercy. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you prayed that and you mean it, God's going to turn your life around. I know he will. He did mine 32 years ago, or going on 32 years ago. And I know that if he can turn mine around, he can turn anybody's around. But Pastor Randy and my wife Judy and all of our church members, we again invite you to come join us Sunday morning at Mountain Harvest Church. Uh, bring somebody with you, uh, and if uh, they're wondering, and you happen to watch the videos on YouTube or on Facebook, and uh, got questions, feel free to call me. So I hope that everybody has a great rest of the week. Look forward to seeing everyone Sunday morning, and may God bless you and. Take care, get your enthusiasm overflowing, make a difference in people's lives. God bless.